Good morning. We welcome you to our Sunday morning service, and it is an honor to have you join us today. Even though we can't come together as a body as we are accustomed to doing, I'm thankful for the medium of video in which we can connect. I appreciate the Word of God, and it's around God's Word that we center our heart, our homes, and our life. It is the compass by which we set the course of each and every day. I want to take just a few minutes and ask you to join me, if you will, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 20. I want to just refer to the first four verses here, and from this, I trust to find something that will help all of us feel the peace of God's Word and the power of His presence in our heart. In Deuteronomy chapter 20 and verse number 1, the Bible says, When thou goest out to battle against thine enemies, and seest horses and chariots and people more than thou, be not afraid of them, for the Lord thy God is with thee, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. It shall be, when you are come nigh unto the battle, that the priest shall approach and speak unto the people, and shall say unto them, Hear, O Israel, ye approach this day unto battle against your enemies. Let not your hearts be faint, fear not, do not tremble, neither be ye terrified because of them. For the Lord your God is he that goeth with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. I'm thankful for the promises of the Lord that are found all throughout his word. Job said that a man born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. And I think we can all relate to that. You don't always have to go looking for trouble because often trouble will seek us out. But isn't it good to know that when trouble comes, God has a plan. I've often said that the one human emotion that the Lord has never felt is the element of surprise. God has never been surprised, therefore he has always had a plan. So it's up to us to seek the face of the Lord and to find that plan. Often that plan is revealed in his word. That's why it's so important for us to have a relationship with the word of God. Not just when we're gathered together for a formal service, but each and every day in our own private time to let the Word of God speak and speak expressly to our heart. There are, there are more than just a few passages of Scripture that underline the fact that God's people do in fact experience seasons of, of trouble in their lives. Both in the Old Testament and the New Testament we find many different scenarios and yet we find the Lord being the Lord each and every time. It's in these overlapping promises of the Word of God passages like Deuteronomy 31 and 6 that says, Be strong and of good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid. I will go with thee. I will not fail thee. I will not forsake thee. And while these words may seem antiquated in the minds of, of carnal men, I want to tell you today that these words are as relevant in the 21st century as they have ever been. In trying times, God was trying to convey to His people I have a plan. When life presents uh, ever-varying uh, uh, troubles and trials and pressures that come against us, we have to realize that we have a God and we serve a God that is not moved by these circumstances. It's sad to say, but sometimes people or even institutions can let us down. But the Lord said, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. I'm thankful to, to read about those promises in the Word of God and, and certainly when our mind, in our mind when we read through His Word and we familiarize, familiarize ourselves with the many characters and situations, we're encouraged by that Word. But even more grateful than just the Word of God, I'm thankful for my own personal testimonies, just like I'm sure you're thankful for your testimonies of where God came through right on time. What the Lord was working out he worked it out with great perfection. In Isaiah 59 and 19, the scripture says, When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. If you know anything about floods, when they come, no matter how much preparation we've made, irrespective of how many sandbags you put in or how big of a dam you build, water, if it keeps rising, has a way of getting over, through, or sometimes even around our best attempt to stop it. 
And when the water does make its way past those intended barriers, it has a way of engulfing any and everything in its path. It has a way of overtaking and overwhelming everything within its reach. And such is the case with the enemy of our soul. I've come to realize that no matter how many spiritual sandbags you put up, sometimes the enemy has a way of getting over, through, or even around them. He has a way of penetrating right through the fabric of the soul of our life. But Isaiah reminds us of something significant in those times. The Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him. I find great peace and great solace in that passage of Scripture. If nothing else, the events that have prevented us from coming together as a church body has served to underscore the importance of belonging to the overall body of Christ. I've always had a deep appreciation for church and certainly love our collective and corporate times of coming together. But I've been reminded over the last several days of just how stabilizing it is to have a family of God. God knew this from the beginning. This was not something that was just thought about in recent times. But in the book of Numbers, chapter 2, and verses 1 and 2, the Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Every man of the children of Israel shall pitch by his own standard with the ensign of the Father's house far off about the tabernacle of the congregation shall they pitch. When the Lord brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, they came out as just one body of people, one mass of people, if I may say. However, God in His infinite wisdom understood the incredible advantage that mankind would have if they were to form a sense of community. God recognizes our need as humanity for structure and for stability. That structure and stability is found in the community that we call church. It is the family of God. And that's why God divided the children of Israel into tribes. He did not intend for them to walk aimlessly on their way to the promised land, groping and feeling their way alone. He intended for them to make that journey together as a community. And He set the structure that He wanted them to follow after. David, in his eloquent way of writing, said, God setteth the solitary into families. It is not the will of God that the solitary stay in a solitary place, but they are to be in the family of God. And there's a sense of family and certainly a sense of community that is provided by the network of the church. With, within the children of Israel, or within the camp of Israel, there were chosen men that would bear the flag, or what the scripture refers to as the ensign, the standard for that particular tribe. In Exodus chapter 2 and verse 2, God calls that standard a sign of your father's house. A sign of your father's house. The children of Israel were, in the truest sense, a nation of people without a country. Therefore, God gave them a structure by placing everyone in a family or a community setting. They were instructed to set their tents facing the standard or the flag. They, that alone would give them the opportunity to develop friendships and perhaps settle them into family communities. When they stepped out of their tent in the morning, I just have imagined in my mind the very first thing they would see was the standard or the flag that represented their tribe or their family. These standards or their flags became very important things to them because as the cloud moved by day or the fire moved by night, they had to move as well. It was important that they stay together. They had to move according to the cloud and the fire because that represented the Spirit of God, the will of God. God promised and indeed kept that promise to lead them all the way to the land that flowed with milk and honey. When they faced obstacles along the way, God was always there to make a way. Sometimes where it just seemed a little impossible and other times where it was in fact impossible, God stepped on the scene and He made a way. He led them by His Spirit. Because we are partakers of that same Spirit, we have the right today to walk in that same authority. And because we have that right, it doesn't matter what the enemy tries to do, 
we can rest assured that God will make a way. He reassured His people time and time again that everything was under His control. While there are places that we can refer to in Scripture to find comfort, and while I am certain that each and every one of us have our favorite Scripture or our favorite place to turn that brings us peace, for me, it is Psalms 91. I could read the 91st Psalm in its entirety, and certainly we can find strength from all of these Scriptures. But I just want to read the first four verses this, this morning. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge, my fortress, my God. In Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with His feathers and under His wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. I'm so encouraged to know that I am covered by the wings of an almighty God. The Lord told Paul something about His grace that we can ill afford to forget. He said, Paul, my grace is sufficient. I'm thankful for the sufficient grace of God that covers us and keeps us in perfect harmony with His will. And so in this day, in this hour, when things seem to be a little uncertain about us, I believe that the church can stand on a sure foundation. We can stand with our feet fixed firmly on the promises of God that are yea and amen. It's been a privilege to be able to speak to you today, and I want you to know that coming up next is a great friend, not only a friend of me, but a friend of our church, Evangelist Douglas Smith. A few days ago, I contacted Brother Smith, and I asked him if he would speak for us today. Brother and Sister Smith are dear friends to our church, and they've preached many, many times here for us, and we trust that time will afford them to come back and be with us again. I, I have no doubt that God is going to use Brother Smith to speak something very relevant into the heart and the lives of our church family today. So I prayerfully ask you to consider the words that shared, not only uh, today in this first segment, but I pray also that we will avail ourselves to the ministry of Brother Smith and let God, through His voice, speak some wonderful promises into our life. Again, it's been a privilege and an honor to have you join us today, and we want you to know that God has His wings covering us. We are safe because we are in His presence. May God bless you in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. It is such an honor to be the digital speaker for Hatchbend Apostolic Church. Uh, we are praying for each and every one of you, and we just count it a delight to come to you through a different medium today. We give honor to Pastor Sister Boyd for extending the invitation, allowing us to be part of what God is doing in these last days. So we are remembering each other in prayer during this time of crisis. And the words speak to me in 2 Corinthians 4 and 8. It says, but we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. We have a hope that the world does not have. That even in times of adversity, we can have peace that passes all understanding. And so for just a few minutes, I want to speak to you from a particular topic found in Mark, the 11th chapter, and the 22nd verse. I want to read just three verses of Scripture. It says, And Jesus answering saith unto them, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. Jesus said, we can speak to the mountain, and the mountain will be moved. And so for just a little while, 
I want to speak to you on this subject, when mountains finally move. When mountains finally move. And so I'd ask, no matter where you are at, uh, where, what you are doing, would you just open your heart with me and let me pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, you know each and every individual that is watching. You know the battles that they are facing and the struggles that they are enduring. But God, we are praying right now that you would rebuke the devourer. You would bind the adversary. You would take authority over the prince and the power of the air. Lift those that are low. Encourage those that are discouraged. and Strengthen those that are weak. Let your word empower. Let it inspire. And let it bless today as we open our hearts to you. God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. It was Lou Nichols that wrote and said, Faith sees the invisible, it believes the incredible, and it receives the impossible. And as we turn to the pages of our Bible, in Hebrews the 11th chapter and the first verse, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Although we would like to be in control, although we would like to see where we are going, for some reason God put it in his plan that we are to walk by faith. Faith is not knowing exactly your circumstances. It's not knowing exactly your direction or where necessarily you are going. But it's putting a trust, a confidence in God that he is in control. Faith can look at something colossal, gigantic, and enormous and say God still has the power. Over and over again, when we flip through the pages of our Bible, we find people in precarious predicaments and we see them facing awful adversity. I know that many of us are dealing with the loss of jobs, trying to figure out how the bills are going to be paid, how to keep our families and houses in order. But we can take refuge in knowing that we are not alone. There have been those that have faced similar situations before. And in the book of Daniel, the 10th chapter, we find a prophet of God, and he is praying and he is fasting and he is seeking the Lord because of the scenario and the situation that he is in and he is calling out to God he is pouring his heart out and while he is in the middle of this prayer and fasting the word of the Lord tells us that an angel appeared to him and the very first words out of this angel's mouth were this fear not. And I feel like those two words are valid in today's world. Fear not, because God is in control. Second Timothy 1 7 says that God has not given us the spirit of fear, but a power and of love and of a sound mind. And we can be cautious, but we don't have to be fearful. Uh, We can be careful, but we don't have to be worried. Uh, What we have, the world does not have. In the world, there is thoughtlessness and thanklessness, carelessness, conceitedness, foolishness and fearfulness, forgetfulness and worldliness. But I'm thankful to know that if you are in the church, we have the exact opposite. We have thankfulness. We have fearlessness, we have godliness and righteousness, joyfulness, happiness and holiness. And even when it seems like the world is coming against you, we can be like Daniel and put our trust in the Lord. And so when Daniel is praying, this angel speaks and says, fear not. Then in Daniel, the 10th chapter and the 12th verse, he says something So interesting. 
He says, from the first day, your words were heard. But in verse 13, he said, it was the prince of Persia that withstood me 21 days. But Michael came to help me. It tells me something that even when it looks like our prayers are not being heard, God is still listening. When it seems like our prayers are not making a difference, we can't see what is going on in the spirit realm. Don't ever underestimate the power of your prayer. Even when you are alone by yourself in the house, your prayer has power. Even if we may not be able to gather in the physical sanctuary, your prayer still has power. Just look at Daniel who called on the name of the Lord and had a visitation from an angel. The angel said, Daniel, what you are doing is making a difference. So I want to encourage my brothers and sisters in Christ today to keep doing what's right. Keep praying, keep fasting, keep seeking the face of God, keep giving to the church. Because regardless of the adversity that we face, God will have a church. And so in this 14th verse of Daniel, uh, the 10th chapter, we find again this conversation going back and forth. And the angel speaks these words in this 14th verse. He says, Now I am come to make thee understand. Uh, The angel was trying to make sure this man of God understood. But just because his prayer was delayed didn't mean his prayer was denied. Uh, Just because the answer to your prayer has not come just yet does not mean that the answer isn't coming. Just because we are dealing with some troubles right now doesn't mean troubles are going to last forever. Just because we are coming together in the sanctuary through a different medium, we may not be here physically, but spiritually doesn't mean it's always going to be like this. It's encouraging to know that our needs are noticed. Uh, Our supplications are seen and our requests are recognized. The prophet said in Isaiah 59, 1, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. God has eyes and he can see. He has ears and he can hear. He has hands and they can reach. And regardless of whatever you are facing, he is still the God that sits high and looks low. Heaven is his throne and earth is his footstool. Jesus said in Mark 10, 27, with men, it is impossible, but not with God. For with God, all things are possible. And we see it time and time again. Even in John, the 11th chapter, there was a request that came to Jesus to come and pray for a man named Lazarus. And they waited and they waited and Jesus never came. And in turn, Lazarus died. And after so many days, Jesus turned his disciples and said, now we need to go and pray for Lazarus. And the disciples, unsure and uncertain of what Jesus really meant by that, Jesus told them, Lazarus is not dead, he's just sleeping. And so they go to where the family has already gathered. And when they arrive, the sister of Lazarus runs out and comes to Jesus and falls down, tells him this, If you would have been here earlier, my brother would not have died. You can see the panic in her voice you can see the frustration in her spirit you can see the agony in her soul jesus i knew you could have fixed this but because you weren't here now look at what we have to deal with and when she said that jesus paused for a moment and then responded and said no your brother lazarus is going to live again 
And when she heard that, she just assumed Jesus was talking about heaven, talking about that great resurrection day. And she said, I know my brother's going to live again in that resurrection. And Jesus turned to her in John, the 11th chapter and the 25th verse. He said, oh, if you would believe your brother's going to live again. And she didn't quite understand. Uh, She went from saying, if you would have been here earlier, Jesus, everything would be fine. And then she fast forward and said, eventually one day everything's going to be fine. At the beginning, we find this woman having yesterday faith. And then by the end, we find her having tomorrow faith. But what God is looking for is today faith. It's easy to look back in hindsight. And it's comforting to know that we can look to foresight. But right now, with what everybody is facing, we don't need yesterday faith. We don't need tomorrow faith. We need people of God to have today faith. That I don't know how it's all going to work out, but God is in control. And Jesus then takes these sisters of Lazarus and takes these that have gathered and then tells them, let's go to the tomb of Lazarus. And so with everybody walking, they find themselves on this tomb. To, towards this tomb and when they arrive there Jesus tells them to do something very unorthodox and unusual he says you need to roll away the stone now I know that uh, we may be watching and you may not be here in the physical uh, but I just have to wonder that if Jesus took us to the graveyard And Jesus took, and we did a little field trip to the cemetery. And he said, now everybody get your shovels. We're going to have a healing service. I think there would be a little worry. I think people would start laughing and being a little uncomfortable. Uh, Jesus, I don't think we understand what you mean. And that's exactly what they said in John 11. They said, Jesus Lazarus is dead. He's been dead for days. It's already over. I can hear family members saying, I'm sorry, Jesus. We've already cashed in the life insurance policy. There's no going back. But no, Jesus said, if you would just believe, you would see the glory of God. And so they rolled away the stone. And Jesus simply said just a few words. He said, Lazarus, come forth. And when he said that, here comes Lazarus still in his grave clothes. Then Jesus says, loose him and let him go. And there the man that was dead was now alive. The one that was already buried was now walking above ground. You know what took place? Mountains finally moved. Mountains don't move instantaneously and immediately. But Jesus said if you would have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, you can say unto the mountain and the mountain will be removed. It was the prophet Joel that said this. Let the weak say I am strong. Uh, You may not feel strong, but let me encourage you, you are strong. You may not feel empowered, but let me tell you, you are empowered. If you are filled with the Holy Ghost, you have a gift that the world did not give. You have the ability to stand when others fall. You have the ability to have strength When you feel nothing but weakness, you have the ability to have faith even though you can't see what's getting ready to come. We must choose our words carefully during this trying time. We've got to make sure we're speaking life and not death. Proverbs 18 and 21, Solomon said, death and life are in the power of the tongue and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. 
Uh, even if you are just sitting by yourself or even with a few of your family members or friends, you can speak to each other and say, life is coming. Revival is not over. Better days are coming down the pipeline. Just because we in the situation now doesn't mean we're always going to be here. Because one day mountains will move. We won't always be confined to our homes. We won't always be away from the sanctuary. Because one day mountains will move again. Oh, hallelujah. I feel the presence of the Lord and the encouragement of God even flowing right now. I remember when I first got in church, my pastor's wife was from a little town called Berea, Kentucky. And she had such a faith in God. And she had went to a church there and supported and did everything she could. But for some reason, there needed to be a church in Berea. And so her, along with some others, got together and began to pray and began to fast, asking God to send someone who could pastor a church, who could dig it out, who could start it from scratch. And so as they began to pray, they would go into town and they would knock on doors and they would witness and pray with different ones. And there was one little hiccup. The, where she lived to get into town was only just a few miles. But because of the landscape of the city, there were these mountains all around the town. And so a few mile trip turned into a 30 or 40 minute journey. And so she was with a few people praying and she made this declaration. And when she said it, they almost kind of laughed at her. She said, I'm praying that God is going to move this mountain. And when she said that, they kind of said, you know, when the Lord, when Jesus talks about that in the Bible, I think he means more figuratively, not literally. I think he's giving something that is symbolic, not a real mountain. And they said, I don't think it's literal. I think it's more symbolic. And so she said, well, I'm just going to pray. And you're going to watch and we're going to see God work. And so they prayed and they prayed. And, and nothing seemed to change. They were keep coming against the same obstacles. Uh, fighting the very same adversary. And so after months of working diligently in prayer and witnessing, uh, she got up and she noticed there were construction workers not far from her house. And they were all driving. And she got in her car and began to drive just a little ways and got to where the mountain was located in that little town. And when she got there, all these crews were working and she got out of her car and different ones were standing around. And she asked a question. She said, do you, you know what's going on here? Uh, we don't see, see this kind of activity, uh, especially this much in this little town. Uh, can you tell me what's going on? And uh, finally, one of the construction workers spoke up and said, well, uh, the city council has decided that uh, to bring more traffic into the town, they're decided to tear this mountain down and they're going to build a road right through the mountain and when she heard that she knew her prayer had been answered others may think it's coincidence or happenstance but she knew without a shadow of a doubt that mountain god had finally moved so as i begin to come to a close in this lesson today can I admonish you and encourage you that mountains still move today. Mountains are not going to stand between us and our faith. Mountains are not going to deter us or distract us or disillusion us. For we know who we believe. We know where our faith is. We know the one that is reliable who has never lost a battle, and who has never let us down. 
uh, Romans 4 and 20 says, And Abraham was full of faith and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he staggered not at the promise of God. So, as we come to this battle that is on the forefront, let's not stagger at the promise of God. His promises are yea and amen. His promises never fail. His promises always come to pass. He promised us he would have a church. He promised us he would return again. He promised us he would send his spirit and it would be poured out in the last days. And so, friends, no matter where you are at, I'm asking you to do a favor for me right now. Can we just raise our hands and can we close our eyes? And would you let me pray for you and let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, you know every battle that's being fought. You know the extreme adversity that people are facing. You know the worry and the fear that's trying to grab a hold of our hearts. God, I'm asking now you would open the windows of heaven. God, would you open up the floodgates and pour out blessings that cannot be contain. God, we know your church thrives in persecution. Your church rises above adversity. Your church conquers every obstacle. Your church overcomes oppression. Your church drives over devils and demons that try to stand in the way. Lord, I'm asking you to visit every home, visit every house, and visit every individual. I pray that same power that we feel in the sanctuary when we gather together that same power would visit us where we are at the power to deliver the power to save and to set free god we pray the fresh wind of the holy ghost would blow right now god we pray it in the name that's above every other name we pray in the name of the lord jesus christ in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you for spending a few moments and let me worship the Lord with you. Together we are in the kingdom of God as one.